The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Father, we just pray a blessing upon Jason right now as he comes forward that he might uh, decree and declare a word that is for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, so good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. We're so privileged to have a place to meet. Amen. Some countries, tough, tough. Got to hide and all that. <clears throat> the Lord was speaking to me this particular message for quite a few weeks, um, even prior to, to the, the birth of my daughter, which she's what, five, five weeks old. Five weeks old, a couple days. Uh, um, I didn't think my wife was actually going to make it today. I, <laughs> she's the, uh, the sleep deprivation is really, is really torture. I mean, I don't know how people... I don't know how she does it and, and can function um, with being up every single hour on the hour all night long, getting, you know, 15 minutes of sleep here and there, 20 minutes there. That's really, I, I, it blows my mind because if I don't get more than, if I don't get more than like four or five hours in a row, I'm like, <laughs> I'm a complete deadhead. <laughs> I can't, I don't have a vocabulary, I can't see, you know, I, so I don't know how she actually drove here. I was hoping that she would be okay. Um, but it is good to have the support that she's here because I was really concerned. One of the th- what, it, what, it, what it is is I wanted to talk a little bit about, actually about my daughter um, that was just born. She, we had um, a very difficult time naming her. We had um, a bunch of things all the way up until the last few minutes. In fact, after she was born, she didn't have a name for quite, for quite a few days. Um, but what the Lord had spoken to me early on, and I, and I fought against it uh, somewhat because I didn't like the meaning of it right off, right, was, was the name Mira. And, and that was the, we, we decided to give that as her middle name. And it was... Uh, pretty interesting the way that the Lord showed it to me because uh, if you take Mira and you, and you, look, at the, you look up the Hebrew definition and everything, it's very closely related to Mara, which is bitter or, or, you know, and I was like, oh, that's a terrible name, Lord. What do you want me to name her that for? But we looked into it further and, and instead of just seeing the surface of that's it and then move on and say, no, forget it. I wasn't hearing the Lord right or what have you. Um, he, he showed me to keep looking. And when I did, I found that it has in all different languages, it means so much. It, 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 there's like a volume of meanings and definitions behind the name Mira. I had no idea. The, um, and how that's related to, the, to today's message is, I'll, I'll get to that, but um, it involves something that we feel, but we can't necessarily pinpoint. Something that is, as we get older, possibly get, we find missing, but we don't quite know what it is. Um, and when I want to call it wonder, okay, when, when we think of it, it's like a, a deep longing or, or a sense for a space for God that we can't really put our finger on. But if we are misguided, we end up trying to fill it with other things than God. And it, it, of course, that doesn't work. But one of the definitions for Mira, which, I, well, in Spanish, of course, it, it means to look. Right? Mira, is that correct? To look or look. It even means uh, something somewhat of a, like a watchtower, which I thought was interesting. It's where we get the word mirror or, you know, looking glass. Um, in Slavic, it means peace. And I said, oh, as soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, this is God. <laughs> God is speaking to me this name. 
we got to, we got to do this. We got through it. But what I thought was really neat was in Latin. It means full of, full of wonder and astonishing, wonderful. It's where we get the word miracle. And I said, ah, oh, that's it. I will define my definition of wonder mixed with a paraphrase that I found, <laughs> found during reading. So this is not all me, but this is so, it's so what I want to express. It's a little bit long, so if you're taking notes, I'll, go, I'll try to go slow. But anyhow, to me, <clears throat> wonder or intimacy with God or the cause for intimacy with God well, first of all, what it's not, it's not fantasy. It's not fulfilled dreams. Because fulfilled dreams are not necessarily fulfilled hope. And it's not fantasy, and I will go into that a little bit later, because it's important to see the difference. Attainment and fulfillment are not the same. Write that down. Attainment and fulfillment are not the same. It is not merely happiness. In fact, wonder has a direct bearing on hopelessness and evil. The loss of wonder sets the stage for evil and opens the doorway to fantasy. Let me say that again. The loss of wonder, true wonder, that's God-given, sets the stage for evil and opens the door to fantasy. I'm struggling to read my notes this morning. This morning I printed out my notes on vellum paper. First of all, I, and, and I don't know if you know what vellum is. It's, it's semi-translucent paper, kind of like an overhead projector thing. Uh, because Grace's wedding, they were printing the inserts for their uh, wedding invitations for my daughter. And they left it in the printer. And so that the first one, I, uh, the first time I got them, I was like all set and I just left them on the printer. I didn't realize. So then some time went by and I didn't have time to reprint it um, until after a while. And then I reprinted it, but everything was so tiny. I forgot to, to increase the font size. So I have to use a card here to keep up with my my notes here so I don't miss the lines up. What, what wonder is, instead of, it's almost, it's almost a complete contrast to fantasy, okay? It's a grasp on reality that does not need constant highs to maintain it, nor is it made vulnerable by lows in life's struggles. It sees the ordinary in the extraordinary but it finds the extraordinary reaffirms what it already knows about the ordinary. Wonder knows how to read the shadows because it knows the nature of light. Think about this in terms of God and his nature and how we should search the scriptures for his nature. If we knew his nature, we would know how to see. Wonder knows that while you cannot look at the light, you cannot look at anything without it. It's not exhausted by childhood, but it finds its beginning there. Wonder impacts the emotions of your heart, then captivates the mind when you learn to surrender and flow in the river of God's will. Amen? Amen? Sorry, I got a little bit choked up. Wonder is fascinating. And if you have ever seen a child, we have, we have a few. If you've ever seen a child open up a gift or a present or what have you, if he, if he has one, 
it's fascinating because like my, my, my dad got Landon a, um, a toy dinosaur, uh, I can't even explain it, it, it kind of hugs, it clips onto your arm and hugs, but you have to stretch its arms out and then it snaps. And he stretches the arms out and plays around with it like an airplane and you know, does all kinds of crazy stuff with it. But he had one, it's like it, you give him one gift and he'll play with it for hours. He'll sleep with it. He brings it in his bed and sleeps with it. And, and, it, and it's like, God, he puts va great value on it, right? But then the, you, you give a myriad of things to him on Christmas morning, and they, they, they get better kick out of tearing up the paper off of the boxes and playing with the boxes and throwing, you know, stuffing around the room than actually playing with some of the toys that they get. It's like the overwhelming, the abundance of all this stuff that we think would give them such joy and we want to pour out on them, of course, you know. Um, you think that that would be the thing, but in reality, it's just the stuff. It's just stuff. There's no fulfillment in it. And if there is joy or something like, you know, it would be sort of like um, watching a fireworks display. You watch it and it's wonderful, but you want to see a different one. You want to see a different color. You want to see a bigger bang. You want to see... It's like, but then it's over. So it's like, kind of like Christmas morning, and then you're cleaning up the next day, and then where did it go? But it's so crazy when you see one, t you take one toy and you give it to him. His eyes get real big. He plays with it all day long. The wonder remains a lot longer when it's just focused on the one thing, right? Um, when we, as we age, we take different disciplines and information and things, and it starts like our experience kind of suppresses some of that wide-eyedness, you know. But God tells us that we're supposed to approach Him like a child, childlike faith, eyes wide open, you know. And if He tells us that, then we're supposed to be able to do with it. It's like He gave it to us so that we should. Um, be guardians over it if it's something that he gave us. But then we all lose it at some point. And it's so gradual that we might not even notice. And, but all of us as, as children, most of us should say as children, had it. Some form of, wow, God is so much bigger. It was even, you know, it's even my, it's like how Landon and Haven look at me like I'm Superman and I could do just about anything because they can hang on my arm and I don't flinch. But, you know, they're tiny. <laughs> but I'm so big to them, you know. Um, like the other day, Landon was afraid that some, a monster was going to step on, him, step on him with his big toes. That's what he said. And I said, well, Daddy's going to take care of that monster for you. And he said, yeah, okay. So it's like, but we lose it somehow. And, and the thing is, is, is God wants to take it take us back to that, not, not to the, to the, the theoretical fan, fantasy type stuff, but in, in, the, in, the, in the childlike faith that he wants us to walk in. And the only thing that, that really keeps us from doing that is the lack of, a, a lack of communion with him, a lack of intimacy with him. Because if we know that, if we know him and we're reading the scriptures like he's, you know, the author of the scripture, and we're searching out for his um, different facets of his himself. And we want him not just to reveal himself, but we want him to apply it to our heart so that we can reveal it to others. That's, there's, a, there's something there that will provide you with endless wonder. It provides, a, a, well, God can, all things are possible. Still, all things are possible. And the thing is, is when we step in and say, well, because I had this experience and that experience, this not, I don't think this is possible anymore. He, he wants us to go back and say, no, we, we, don't, we don't want to go that route. We want to stay on what God wants us to stay on. And he says that all things are possible. So how do we get that back, though? Well... There's a few things that, 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 that keep us, that, that help us lose 
the, the particular type of wonder, that there's actually a, a possibility to have intimate relationship with the Lord um, through our lives. And one is, is, is just poor reasoning. We base, every, we base a lot of it on experience. We've had a lot of letdowns over, over time. Um, we could even be uh, caught up in fantasy, trying to plug in that space of God. I did it my, my, my entire, gosh, before I came here and, and learned how to deal with things through, you know, the 60-day challenge and what have you and pray things through correctly. Um, I plugged everything into that space that I, that with, I plugged it in with women and relationships and, and um, work for the most part. And the thing is, is I, it, it's not, it was never fulfilling. It can't be fulfilling if it's not God. God is the only way that we can actually get fulfilled in, in anything that we feel that we need. There's, there's a couple things that I saw that is because of the lack of intimacy with the Lord and wanting that intimacy with God, that the church, um, there's a couple things that I saw over the past couple weeks even that um, were kind of bothering me a little bit about uh, people my age and younger, mostly. Um, they're getting caught up in, um, it's the war, of the, basically the war of the head and the war of the heart Christians. And, and there's always been that, the head and the heart people. It's like they're, but we need both. Um, when I say that, it, it's basically there's some passion, very passionate people that are younger than, than me that, that have churches and that are, you know, community and what have you. Uh, community is a real big thing, t- term-wise. Um, but for the, for the most part, a lot of them are misdirected. And the, the way I, I see it is if there is no relationship, there's no true reality in them that they can measure what, what is God and what's not God. And so what happens is, is you get the head people that go either legalism or they, where they, they distribualize everything that's in, going on internal, that internal longing, they trivialize it to make it really not that important. The internal longing for that intimacy with God, they make it not important as much as the rules and the law. <clears throat> and then you have the heart people that go in the opposite direction. Um, and they go towards the more artistic and the, the more flowery, romantic um, mysticism, Eastern mysticism, or, you know, universalism. Uh, different oddball things that are out there right now. It's more attractive because it's not as harsh. It's not as black and white. It's some, it, it makes you feel like you're, you have a lot of freedom, right? And so it's attracting a lot of younger folks. And the way it is, is uh, it's not this that there's no sin, which in universalism, there's no hell, you know. So you can't really, you're not really afraid of doing anything wrong or what have you, but um, the emptying of the mind See, there's no scripture that ever says that empty the mind and become one with everything. There's no scripture that says that. In fact, it's, it, it's renew your mind, right? Um, we should be meditating, meditating on, these, on the scripture and, and, having it ch- and having it change us from the inside out. It's not, it's not that we don't think at all. There's nothing that says cut off your head, you know. Um, Unfortunately, when you go to the artist realm, the artist, artistic, or the flowery, romantic type, uh, you get to a point, because honestly, there's, there's blogs, and there's books, and there's huge blogs, and if you read some of these people that are, that are a little bit off, meaning that they're just going off in that direction as far as the artistry and all that stuff, they, we call them wordsmiths, and, and they, they sound so profound, and flowery and and by the time you're re- you're done reading 42 pages long of this particular blog and inspirational things 
you find out there's nothing in it. It's fluff. To make it, it just sounds okay. I mean, it sounds good. It tickles your ears, but it doesn't stir emotion the way that God wants it to. It may, it may stir the fantasy, but it never points to Christ. Even though Christ may be in some of the statements, which is really spooky, especially if they're not Christian, which we found some of those. One of the, one of the statements or the quotes that I, I thought was really interesting that I read was, um, that puts it kind of in perspective, is philosophers question the dream that life must experience enchantment while romantics dream away the question. But it's so true that it's the, the head people that had the, the question and the romantics that don't want it. They, they, they want to be free. <laughs> How do we get back that which was lost and that was entrusted to us? Let me tell you one thing that's, that I thought, you know, I think you have to understand why we were given the Bible as it was written. And not to be, you know, not to follow it legalistically and you have to do this and you can't do that and, and what have you. It was the, it's the living word of God. It's supposed to, it's supposed to, it's been given to us to show us how we should be living, right? And give us the, um, the sense from, by his spirit to be able to do those things that it tells us to do and not to do. It, it's how we learn about God's goodness and his favor and his character. Um, we need the law. We need the, the, the rules of the game, so to speak. Because what happens, what happens if you have a football game, but you don't have any lines on a field? Or you have a tennis court that has no boundaries or, and nowhere to pick, no particular way that they set the net up. Well, one week we could have it over here, one week we could have it over here. It makes no sense. The rules were created to protect the game, not the other way around. If we take it, in, I mean, life is not a game, but if we take it in perspective as that's why the Bible was written, and that's why we have the words on the page, um, if we follow the rules and the boundaries that God has given us, it opens the door back. So basically it's by obedience, by obedience of his word, it, it starts us on the track back to fulfilling that wonder and that intimacy with him. In Psalm 119, verse 96, it says, To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. In that one simple statement, the two different points I wanted to bring up was to all perfection. That means that there's an end. There's a goal. There's a, there's a finish line to all perfection. There's an end point. The second part is, but your commands are boundless. They're, they're wide open spaces. They're not there to confine us, to restrict us, to see if we could go so far, push them out. He put boundaries his commands are boundaries. They're inexhaustible. You could actually experience inexhaustible contentment if you live within those precepts that God intended for the purposes of your life. What, I, what we have seen is that there's so many people that struggle with the, the, legal, the legalism and you know, you cry legalism, legalism, every time you quote scripture and what to do and what not to do, what the scripture says, it's like people cry legalism because they want, well, we're now in grace, we're now in, you know, we can, yes, but we have the grace to be able to do those things, to accomplish that which he's asked us to do and to how to live those things. The, the, the boundaries is set like a farm that has fences around it. We have that entire wide open space to do whatever we want to do, to live the way that God wants us to do, protected from 
the mountain lions and the different things that are around. See, God doesn't put, he doesn't put boundaries around things that he doesn't want to protect. It's funny how most of the time that wonder is actually expressed is in the Psalms. At least half of the times throughout the scriptures when it's actually said, it's, it's spoken about in the Psalms by David. And I think that that's wonderful. Of course, when David tried to push the boundaries of God and tasted stolen waters, he found them quite bitter, just like Mira Mara. Trading a lifetime of regret for just a moment of pleasure. But when he lived in the, within the parameters that God had set for him, he found the law to be perfect, sweeter than the honeycomb, he says. And his delight was boundless. David found it. David understood wonder, right? He understood it fully. He understood it. He sang about it. He sang to God about how wonderful, how wonderful, how majestic everything. He's, if, you, if you have any questions about wonder, just go through Psalm 119 and read about the word. Every boundary set by God points to something worth protecting. Write that down. Every boundary, even if there are certain boundaries, and we've talked about boundaries before, but any, even if there's certain boundaries that God wants you to, to, to place in your life, even if it's with a, another toxic individual between you and family members, that if God wants it there, it's because he, he knows that something is worth protecting because you're valuable to him. If we are to protect the God-given wonder, of existence, we need to learn what God's commands are all about. We need to feed and feast upon His Word, not just read it. His commands are there to protect what life truly is about. And implementing the truth in our lives keeps us from losing wonder. It's so funny when you hear that it, you're stifling me. I can't do what I want to do. I'm, I don't necessarily want to be a Christian or I just... Basically, just got to say, you know, I said the sinner's prayer, and that's all I really want. It's such a shallow, shallow life. There's so much more. And you will know that there's so much more because you'll want it and you'll desire it, just like all of us. We were made to want more. We were made to have that void filled. We were made to have that space taken up by God, no matter what you want to call it. Let's take a look at looking. There's a big difference between looking at and looking through. We make a colossal, the colossal mistake often with God's Word and the printed pages on it even. We let it sit on our shelves untouched. It gets dusty sometimes. I'm not talking about you all in general. I'm just saying in, <laughs> in, in general. There's certain things that we just don't want to go into. Certain books of the Bible even we, we avoid. But the difference between looking at and looking through is that you see a Bible on a shelf that's a looking at it. You could flip through the pages. You could look at that. There's printed words on the pages. But if you're actually looking through it and you're looking between the letters and you're looking between the different verses to experience God, to know Him, then you get a whole different perspective on the Scriptures. It's not, no longer thou shalt not and thou shalt. It is becoming who you should be, be becoming in Christ. It's transforming if you allow it to be. David in Psalm 119 has 171 out of the 176 verses pointed to the Word of God and its revelation within within that section. Psalm 119, 171 out of 176 of the verses pointed back to God's Word and His revelation of the Word. It's very important. Words within words. If you didn't know even just that statement that I made, it's because you stopped at the, at the, at the basic, tr you looked at it and you said, well, there's 177 verses. It'll take me a day and a half to, to, you know, to read that and if I, if I really stick to it, maybe. 
figure out what it says. But if you never go deeper and you never realize what, what, it, what the things point to in the scriptures, it's such a waste. What David wants us to get a grasp of is that there's nothing in the world more important than understanding how the written word points beyond just the language that you're reading in the printed page, but to the actual author of speech itself. Amen? We often take and pull the carpet out underneath power and wonder and the divine purposes out of, out of what God is actually wanting us to do by trivializing the scriptures as, well, they're just, they're old. They don't pertain to today. There's a lot of people that think that. A lot of young folks you can't apply this to society. In fact, it's even, you know, you can't play, you can't, you know, take that word of God and, and preach it just on the street. It's a shame. It's offensive. It always was. Jesus was offensive too. Oh well. But the thing about the old stuff, when you say, oh, this is old teaching, it's not pertinent for today. Well, I tell you what, that, that hunger and thirst, that void that you felt before you got saved, the increasing hunger after you got saved, is not a, it's a timeless thing. It happens for everybody. It's specifically created that way. We are created that way, to have that hunger, that fill that void. It's not just for the past and old. It is for the now. When you think about thinking, and my dad usually says about scriptures, we want to we wanna basically feast upon the word. We want to drink, drink it in and... When we think about thinking, and as far as like the cerebral area of thinking, it's, that's like the shallowest that you, could be, that you could be. And that's where you can actually fall into the legalism, is, is, is really shallow thinking. Um, no matter how deep thought-provoking uh, words you can create, and wordsmithing, and what have you, it's still shallow. But there's a, there's a way to be able to allow the Holy Spirit when you're reading and, and feeding upon His Word to create a transformation. And that transformation will take place and start changing the way that you think. A lot of the people that teach out there are, are saying the, say the opposite. And it's like you, you have to read it and memorize it and say it over and over again and eventually you're going to change. But in reality, it's, it's the Spirit of God that works in us that, that does the changing and then the mind goes along with it. I was reading a story. I think, I think his name is Henry Nguyen. Um, he was a Harvard professor that wrote the story of um, how the, uh, Rembrandt, Rembrandt had a painting of the prodigal. And I know that, I think my dad's taught about it before, certain aspects of it. But Henry Nguyen was a Harvard professor that was really struggling. It was, this is back in, I think, in the 20s. Might have been. He was really struggling about his, if he was really going the right direction with his life. And it's not that we don't have those struggles too, right? <laughs> we want to know the right direction and what, what God wants for us ultimately. But he was really having a hard time with, with um, his life at the time. And he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go visit the, the, the Armitage. Is that how you say it? Armitage Museum in Russia where the painting actually is. And he stood and looked at the painting. And it's not that he just looked at the painting, but he was looking at it, and he didn't study it for just a few minutes or an hour or so. It was like seven hours he stood and, and, and looked at this painting. And when he left, he went home, flew home, quit his, quit his uh, professor job at Harvard, and began to work as... Um, he worked with the mentally retarded... In a, in a home um, not that far from where he lived. And, and that's what he did for the rest of his life. And the way that he explains it in his book was the fact that he felt that when he was studying the painting, 
there's there's two different aspects of this. You study you study the painting. He's like studying the brush strokes and and the lighting and and the different figures that are actually in it and what they're doing and how they look and the prodigal. Was I saying it? I didn't ever say it. <clears throat> Rembrandt's painting painting was of the prodigal. And I thought it was so fantastic. So fantastic, but the thing was is seven hours. You cannot tell me. I mean, obvious transformation took place because of the, 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 the change in him, right? In his life. How did, the, how did the transformation, the transformation did not take place because he was daydreaming about a painting. It was because it was the Word of God. It was the Word of God in a, in a, in a picture. It was God himself with his son that had just returned. It impacted his heart so much that it changed. It gave him direction. It, it transformed him just by going over it in his head. It was, a, it was a perfect picture of the scripture that was of the prodigal. It's the transformation part that God wants us to have. It's that you can't get it by just somebody waving a wand, somebody casting out something, somebody saying this. You have to build it in a relationship with him, which is possible. Some people don't even want to say, you know, you don't even want to hear that anymore, that it's possible. You just want to be a good Christian and do what the Bible says and come to church and go home and, you know, have your community and, and then leave. Um, it's that Christianity is a whole lot more than just community and child, you know, games and, and services and groups and discussions. It's deep. He wants us to go so much deeper than what we have, we've been. It, we don't want to be shallow Christians. We want to actually get in and, and enjoy the, the fullness of what he's actually given to us inside his parameters. <laughs> Amen. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, I know whom I've believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. When you entrust him with your life, he generates wonder. Maybe you didn't commit yourself or your longing, that thirst for more, into his hands. Perhaps you lost the sense of wonder the sense of his presence and tried desperately to fill that void with things, with reasonings, with experiences, activities, perhaps even fantasy or relationships. Just want to just close your eyes and I want to pray real, real quick. I'm going to end a little bit early today. I haven't had no sleep either. <laughs> but I want to pray. Let's close our eyes. I want to pray. Lord, I, I receive forgiveness for having gone after things that were not in your plan for me. I receive forgiveness for the misplaced search to fill something that only you can fill. Lord, help develop in us a grateful heart because we know that ungratefulness is one of the most evil enemies of your wonder and your faith and faith in you. We want to be more grateful than the giver, for the giver than the gift. Amen. We want to be more grateful for the purpose than for the present and for life itself rather than for abundance. Help us value relationship rather than any benefit made possible by the relationship. Amen. Thank you in Jesus' name. 
The, the few things that I want you to, to remember, I know this was, this was a little bit of a struggle today, but there's wonder all around us. And if you just watch a, a child like one of my kids who, who, can, who can find wonder in any of the simplest things in life, whether it's a stick or a box. I mean, those of you who have, have had cats you know, know that they really like boxes. They think that they're really great. But kids do too. Um, he wants to fill us with wonder again. He wants us to have a life that's enchanting, but reality. You, you, you can have both. He wants us to have that. God can do it. Or I don't know how to get out of this situation, but I know that God is with me. There, there is so much in, in the scriptures where David cried out over and over again, but then he's always, he always calms himself down and says, God is with me. And he, study David. <laughs> he's, it's, it's just incredible. I think that's why that's probably one of the, uh, David is one of the um, areas in the scriptures where it's wonder is mentioned most often is because he was so overwhelmed by his goodness and overwhelmed by his mercies and overwhelmed by everything that he's helped, he helped him with and his different times of need and, and um, irregardless of his, his screw-ups, major screw-ups, I mean, murder and adultery is not a little thing, God still took him back and still praised him as somebody that would do all his will, who loved him and did, would did all his will. It's because he didn't see any of that garbage that he did in the past anymore. He was truly repentant, and he continued on in the scriptures in light of that. The takeaways from today, I wanted you to, to I wanted to reiterate, in case you missed them and and what have you. But one was attainment and fulfillment are not the same. Every boundary set by God points to something worth protecting. His commands are there to protect what life is truly about. And <clears throat> implementing that truth in our lives keeps us from losing wonder. And lastly, be mindful of the one of the biggest enemies of wonder <coughs> and our intimacy with God, and that's ungratefulness. Ungratefulness is, is one of the things that it sneaks up on you. It sneaks up on you. The different things you can you can you can get a new car, a new house. You can get a, a, an unexpected gift in the mail. You know all those things you can be grateful for, but they don't last. It's like the, it, it's like it wears off. The shininess wears off, and and gratefulness, a spirit of gratefulness, needs to be continually worked on to keep. I mean, you look at the children in the wilderness, they, they, were, they become ungrateful even though all of these things God did for them. And these were things that God did miraculously for them. And they still were murmuring, complaining after a while. See, it kind of sneaks up on you. So you have, to get, you have to go back to that place. Lord, if there's any place that in my heart that was, I'm ungrateful, just help me with that. I, re I receive forgiveness for being ungrateful and restore a grateful heart in me. Amen. That's all. That's it. All right. <laughs>
of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.